Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking to Hellevorn about her story, which you can read on Tapas, called Midsummer. Midsummer is another one of her short stories, and it's in a separate series. It's by itself, rather than being in a series like Tales of the North. Right, exactly. So uh, Midsummer is, uh, uh, well, it's, it's a, it was originally part of my series of short stories with uh, the characters of my novel Sons of Disobedience shown in different uh, uh, situations. Um, so um, I think it would fit uh, along with the other stories of Tales of the North, but I made it a separate series. Um, it is a slice of life story in my usual setting of uh, 10th century Scandinavia. And this time it takes place in Norway and it is about two teenage boys called Helge and Lars um, who talk about the midsummer party that took place the night before. And uh, in the process of describing their experiences, um, they realize that they may want to be more than just friends. Um, so uh, this is basically the plot. Being a slice of life story, it is really not plot focused. It is, uh, it is focused on the characters and uh, um, their personality and the dynamic between them. Mm -hmm. How do you say it compares to your other short story that we talked about, Home Gone? Um, I think it is also among the short stories that are more light toned, like Home Gone is. Well, of course, Hong Gang uh, describes a duel. So, well, I guess it has a bit of violence if, if, if we count two people dueling as well. So I, th I think it can, but the, the main focus is not really the duel. It is more like the pretext to present characters. And uh, it does have this in common with Midsummer because Midsummer also, the plot of it is a pretext to let the characters uh, really show themselves to the reader. Mm -hmm. So um, it is also light toned, um, but it's not, um, it's not an action story like Midsummer is. So, so this is the basic difference. Mm -hmm. So in essentially, like both of them are human uh, studies of human nature. Exactly, exactly. And um, um, human nature in general, and also um, social attitudes in North Scandinavia. Mm -hmm. So what would you say is the main theme of this particular story? Would homosexuality count as one of the main themes? Oh, yes, definitely. It is a story about love, friendship, relationships, and of course it is mainly about a homosexual relationship, although it may not uh, seem so in the beginning because the story starts with Helgi and Lars uh, going fishing. And they, um, um, they are talking about what happened at the party last night, which takes uh, place uh, during the summer solstice. And uh, it is a party where the entire village uh, takes part and it gets quite wild after a while uh, because uh, both Helgi and Lars um, meet some girls who uh, have come to visit their relatives and, and they are from a different part of the country. And uh, well, I guess they want to have fun and the guys want to have fun as well. And they socialize and they drink and it gets to them I think, well, <laughs> making couples, finding partners or something for the evening. And um, uh, Helgi is quite a charismatic guy and he is, he is funny. He is quite good looking. Uh, they are 16 at this point. And uh, well, one of the girls is really into him. And uh, the next morning, he's so excited about all that because he hasn't been in any kind of relationship before. It was his first kiss and everything. And so he's really excited and he wants to tell his best friend about it. Well, his best friend happens to, um, happens to not be very happy for him. 
<laughs> and uh, it turns out that the, the way that Lars spent the entire evening was not as, as glamorous as Helgi because Lars spent his evening fighting um, with, with another guy from the village. Um, we are in Norse times and uh, these are some we can say typical Norse teenagers. What they like doing is uh, um, proving how good they are in fighting and sports competitions. So Lars focuses on this, presumably because he doesn't want to think about his best friend <laughs> kissing some girl he met at the party. So yes, he's also competitive and he wants to prove his fighting skills, but at the same time, uh, as the story progresses, we realize is that there may be more to his attitude and his behavior at the party than, than we can say. Uh, Lars also had, well, he, he met one of the girls as well, but it did not work out as, uh, as well for him as it did for Helgi. Um, so how do you think that, you know, Lars and Helgi's attitudes towards, you know, those girls and the party illustrate any aspect of how the Norse saw manliness? Oh, yes. Well, manliness is a very important theme uh, in, um, in saga literature. And um, I, I did mention this before when I talked about uh, my other stories, including Hong Kong and Lucky Wall, but I did so because it is such a prevalent theme in saga literature because uh, it, it, it was a society where gender roles were extremely clearly defined and, and well, men and women sort of live in, in a different world at this time. And uh, um, so certain behaviors, attitudes and characteristics are strictly associated with one gender or the other. So uh, it, it is a society where being manly, which would mean strong, brave, warlike, honorable, and dynamic is extremely important. And uh, so uh, uh, I, it, the, well, Norse boys are taught from a very young age that the most important quality that they can have is to be manly, which means all these things, all these good qualities associated with it. So uh, Helgi and Lars, like, probably most boys in the Viking age would grow with this idea that they have to be to be warlike, to, to be good at sports and to be well, also hard working. But I guess that, uh, well, you can prove your manliness in more than one way. So they are very much into, into sports and competitions. And this is why they, uh, um, they want to prove their fighting skills that they can drink a lot and not get very drunk and also that they can be successful with ladies <laughs> if i can say <laughs> that and um of course on the one hand they have this perception of reality and on the other they come to realize that uh, they like each other and not only as best friends, that, that they are attracted to each other. And um, this sort of has a lot to do with the, with the theme of manliness be because of how Norse people viewed homosexuality. Um, we don't know well, we don't know anything about homosexual couples in medieval Scandinavia, but from the things that we do know, from laws, from insults, from general attitudes about gender roles, we know that homosexuality was very much frowned upon. Um, well, there is nothing about it being considered sinful or, or evil or something in pre-Christian times and in the centuries that follow, because a lot of the sagas are written in the 13th century, where Scandinavia had been Christian for well, two centuries at least. So even in early Christian times, there is no talk about it being sinful, but it is uh, considered a subject of ridicule. So this is the general attitude that the Norse have about, uh, about homosexuality. And um, so the, the worst thing in this world is someone calling a man unmanly. 
So having the passive role in a sexual relationship is considered a womanly trait. So it is assumed that in a homosexual relationship, one would have to be on the receiving end, at least from time to time. So this is what brings uh, the shame that the Norse people perceive. So in sagas, we have insults and pranks that people are played, which show us that it was considered ridiculous and, and shameful. So uh, if a man is insulted by being called arger, which means unmanly, he has to prove his manliness in a duel. So it is that important not to be considered gay or unmanly in, in a way. So I think that Helgi and Lars uh, do a lot to compensate for this, especially after they start having their relationship and after they figure out that they uh, also like men. Um, I think they, they do much more to compensate. Uh, and uh, with, with Lars, he's more belligerent because he also likes uh, fighting a lot and uh, wrestling mostly. And uh, he does that more adamantly. And with Helgi, I think that Helgi has uh, an easier time fitting in. Um, first of all, because he's bisexual, so he doesn't really have to, to fake his attraction to women. And also because he is very outgoing and friendly. And um, he doesn't, well, he, he generally blends in more, so he doesn't have to to pretend as much. So, um, well, yes, I think, I think this, this sort of answers uh, about their attitudes, but, but it is their, their personalities as well that, um, that influence the way that they act. Um, yeah, and the way they, they manifest these social attitudes. Mm -hmm. I see. So would you say that Lars' introversion, because we did talk about introverted characters last time, and he was one of them, really affects the way he sees himself and his lack of manliness? If he was more extroverted, would he be considered more manly? Or would it just be easier for him to say, you know, blend in? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, not really. I mean, I think that what makes people not question Lars's manliness is the fact that he's introverted because he he's generally seen as the kind of guy who you, you don't you don't want to mess with I think because he's kind of silent but he also likes fighting a lot so uh, people don't usually uh, insult him because they they think he will react in an aggressive <laughs> manner so uh, so I think this is what makes people not question him and with Helgi I think that people just uh, he, he's very agreeable and this is why people don't insult him and don't question his, his sexuality so, <laughs> this, this is what I was talking about when I said that their, their personalities really influence the way that that people uh, perceive them uh, e even when it comes to this uh, so yes how about Eyjolf because in, in comparison does Eyjolf's um his bisexuality does that kind of make people feel like he's not as unmanly as he appears to be because he wears women's clothing a lot <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah, that, that's a really good question because with Eolf it was, uh, it, it's, it's a very different way in which I touch upon this subject of, uh, uh, well, non-heterosexuality because uh, Eolf really takes this to the extreme because he also wears women's clothes, which is generally punishable by law in Norse times. Uh, or at least it was, uh, for example, it was a, a very good reason for, for a woman to divorce her husband. If, if you catch your husband wearing a skirt, for example, you can, type, you can divorce him right away. <laughs> <laughs> because it is inadmissible. But the fact that Eilf does this publicly, yeah, that, that makes him very controversial. But of course, Eilf is uh, a religious professional. So this sort of changes the, 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 the issue. And because it was, uh, it was sort of accepted. I mean, it was still controversial, but uh, mystics did 
uh, wear women's clothes because as, yeah, but like I explained as a, um, in order to perform witchcraft, you had to wear certain uh, beads and uh, a certain kind of attire that was associated with women. So yeah, to, um, to answer the question, yes, definitely the fact that Ilf is bisexual makes him less controversial because he is often seen with women as well. And so it's not really that weird if, if men are seen in his company and at his parties as well, because they can easily say, well, yeah, there, there are a lot of non-conformist ladies that are hanging around with Eilf. So of course I like going to his parties. You have no proof that I was with a man. Maybe I was with one of the, the, those ladies who like to have fun, you know? <laughs> So, that's so true definitely. yeah <laughs> so Eolf, Lars and Helgi generally don't get questioned for their sexuality and they're not attacked for it well, Eolf is well uh, Eolf sexuality is is public I mean everybody knows that he is bisexual but because he's also with women it's well, that, that makes it sort of better. And he also has a daughter, so uh, that makes it better. And he he lives with a woman uh, who is his assistant, Hildegun, so they are not in a relationship, but with with other people. I mean, from the outside, he, he is almost married and has a child, so that makes it okay. So even if people know that he is, well, strange because he's an eccentric guy overall so but that's not such a big issue so yeah yeah but with Helgi and Lars I don't think anyone suspects that they are anything other than heterosexual because they don't uh they, they don't show um they don't show their relationship uh in front of other people except for their closest friends which are Ranveig and uh, um, the well, Helgi's sister Gerda, and uh, another one of their female friends. So um, only they know for sure that Helgi and Lars are in a relationship. And later on in Sons of Disobedience, they will meet Aiden and befriend him. And well, it will take months before Aiden himself realizes the nature of their relationship because they, they hide it really well. I mean, I wouldn't really say that they hide it because they are also best friends. So they just don't, well, kiss or something. I mean, uh, I don't imagine they hold hands uh, even when they are alone. So it's not something they, they would probably think of doing. So um, they don't even have to fake that much. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. true. Yeah. I didn't realize is the nature of their relationship. Looking back, he realizes that there were so many signs. He just had no idea that he could interpret them in that way. Especially since Aiden was so sheltered. Oh yes, exactly, exactly. So, so he doesn't even consider that there are people who are not heterosexual because, because of the way he, he was taught to perceive those things. I mean, he uh, surely because he, he was not only for a very strictly Christian family, but he was also a monk. He was surely under the impression that uh, such people would be, I don't know, strange or or deviant or something but and this is why he doesn't imagine that nice people like Helgi and Lars are like this and of course this will change his perception on on this whole um, issue mm -hmm. and do you think Aiden thinks Helgi and Lars are nice people because as covered in Sons of Disobedience in the chapter you showed me, we get to see a different side of them as raiders. So even though they seem to be very nice, Aiden feels like it's kind of in con con contradiction to this side of them because you know they were responsible for raiding his monastery and taking him as a slave to Scandinavia, but then they turn around and they try to befriend him. So it's very contradictory. Oh yes, that is an excellent question. 
Um, indeed, um, here in, in Midsummer, we get to see the, uh, the friendly and um, cute and goofy side of them because uh, well, this is mostly how they are with each other, even, uh, I mean, especially in this kind of situation when they, they want to, to let the other know their feelings for each other. So it's, it, it, it's a sweet moment eventually when they drop the mask. But in Sons of Disobedience, yes, we get to see a different side of them. And Aiden especially, unfortunately, gets to experience a different side of them because uh, they are among those, those, those people, that, the Vikings that raid the monastery that Aiden is uh, studying in, um, in Northumbria. And um, at first, um, of course, he thinks that they are all the same and they are all savages and all that. But once he goes to Norway, uh, he finds it very strange that some of them try to befriend him and Lars and Helgi especially. And they, they, they suddenly start uh, behaving like he, Aiden was just another teenage boy from their village. And he doesn't really understand at first how this fits. And, um, and and what, why they have this attitude towards him? Like, do they not understand the severity of what they did? And I think that what happens here is that Olgi and Lars are, are really good natured boys and quite sheltered because they are from, from a village that is not, um, well, they, they never leave their village until that moment. And, uh, they only know a few people that live there and they, they don't really have knowledge of the outside world, but they grow with this, uh, they are raised with this idea that you have to be a good warrior and uh, one of the greatest honors is being taken by uh, a great warrior to, to fight under his command. So of course, when Ingvar uh, takes them in his troop, it is a great honor for for their families. I, I imagine their families go to England and say, please take our boys. They are 17 now. They can go with you raiding. It, it would be an honor for, mm -hmm. for, for us as families if, if you took them. And um, um, they also play an, I think, important part uh, at the raid. So they are really happy about it. But once they see what they actually have to do, well, I, I'm pretty sure it is, it is a moment they, they struggle with. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there is some, well, I wouldn't really call it PTSD, but there is some of that involves some guilt, a lot of guilt involved because, um, well, they thought they would do it because they willed themselves into doing that because they, they believe that was the, the right and honorable thing to do uh, to prove themselves. But at the same time, they didn't really feel great about it, but they try to because they, they think it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, of course, the, the whole issue with Vikings, so with, with people who go raiding in the Viking age, um, well, they, they are basically, a Viking is basically a pirate and an adventurer. So um, in sagas, we see the word Viking when, when they mean, really mean pirates. So for example, oh, well, when I traveled abroad, I got attacked by Vikings in the Baltic Sea. So they call Vikings also people who are not from Scandinavia, but they are just pirates, you know. But at the same time, to, to go in, in a Viking, it's like going in an adventure. So a lot of men do that when they are young to make money and to get some experience in battles. And then they come and set mm -hmm. up and make a family. So this is a sort of a starting point to, to prove your worth in the community. And this is what, how they see it as well. And also it is, it is a part of a greater endeavor. It, it is part of the, uh, well, resistance against King Olaf wants to convert the country to Christianity. So they feel like they are doing something important. 
So this is why they do it. But of course, it takes Aiden a lot to understand their attitude. But um, well, then the, I, I think they also befriend Aiden out of guilt on the one hand, because they sort of feel sorry for him um, and that they were part in it because they realized that he he isn't having it easy, you know, especially in the beginning mm -hmm. because he's a slave. Uh, but at the same time, they do it because they are friendly and they are curious about him and they are just friendly people, especially Helgi. I mean, they're both they're both friendly, but Lars, uh, for Lars, it takes a while to, to socialize with people, but once he gets comfortable, he's also a very friendly guy. So they just want to be friends because it is quite a small community and there aren't a lot of, of teenagers, of teenage boys. Mm -hmm. I see. That is quite complex and I think very contradictory, you know, because when we think about it from our modern eyes and our you know, using our modern sensibilities, it does feel very odd, right? Especially since, you know, they don't seem to feel enough guilt to help Aiden change a lot of things in his life. They just kind of observe from the sidelines, right? Oh, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And, um, well, yes, definitely, they, they, they aren't very, um, I don't know, perceptive or insightful or something they they realize that Aiden is in a bad situation and they are partly to blame but uh they think that uh, I don't know this is life and that would have happened even if they weren't in mm. in that uh, group of people who who raided the monastery so they are just doing what uh trying to to help him accommodate if if anything Mm -hmm. do the other characters have similar viewpoints about this kind of thing do we know any of the other raiders in the story oh yes definitely well most of the characters in the story take part in the raid and we get to see very different attitudes um i don't think um well i think helgi and laris are among the most friendly of them but then we also have someone like Hawthorne who really takes a liking to Aiden as well. And, um, but, but they were all raised with this kind of attitude. So basically when, when we talk about uh, the whole Viking mentality, it is, it is the, at the attitude and these values of honor and the way they understood honor that are to blame for a lot of things that we perceive as, as bad nowadays. So there can be nice people among them, like uh, Helgi, Lars, and Hakon. And then we can have people who are actually, uh, well, bad, if, if I can say that, like Oswald mm -hmm. and, um, and, and his, his, his friends. So uh, we get to see a lot of different attitudes. How about Rheinweg? Was she part of the raid? Uh, well, no, she isn't. She isn't. She really liked to go, but her uncle doesn't let her go. He's he's quite reluctant. I mean, on on the one hand, he he wants her to fight, but I think he wants her to fight rather in a, a sporty kind of way. So not really to send her out there because he's worried that something might happen to her. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, uh, and maybe if he's around, but being a Jarl and all that, he didn't go on, on a raid. I mean, he's, he's already old and he has other preoccupations and he, he wouldn't just send her with a lot of men so that she can, I don't know, some, something can happen to her. You exactly, know? Yeah. yeah. But she really wanted to go, I'm sure. I'm not sure if she would fare better than Helgi and Lars. I mean, um, there is this attitude of bravado among, among the, the Norse teenagers. And some of them, when they're placed in those situations that they always say, oh, I really want to go there and I really want to fight. Once they are in those situations, they find themselves overwhelmed. And Helgi and Lars really do. The problem with Helgi and Lars is that they will continue to be placed in these situations even after the raid because uh, they have to 
they work for Ingvar and Ingvar sends them on different errands. And that also appeared in, in the part of the novel that uh, we were discussing earlier, where, where they are sent on, on different errands where they have to use these, um, well, fighting skills and they have to, to, to threaten this person and that. And, and even with Aiden, they put up this image that, oh, I'm handling it. I, I was given this responsibility and I will do it like a real man. But when Aiden observes them, he realizes that they struggle with it and it's not them, but they really try to do their best. Mm -hmm. I because see. They think this is the, the good thing to do. So it's, well, it's very different from our attitudes nowadays, right? So mm -hmm. maybe we, we see it in a completely different way because we know that it's not the good thing to do, but, and, and, and we would be worried if we thought, if we enjoyed it too much, but with them, it's the other way around. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So do you think their friendship with Aiden really changes their views on this whole thing eventually, or does it not really change their views? Oh yeah, yeah, that, that's a good question. It changes the views of all of them involved because with Helgi and Lars, um, I think that they learn a great deal about other cultures and other beliefs because they were so isolated in the, in the part of the world where they lived. They never met someone who was from a different country. And they find it really interesting to, to get to know Aiden and uh, because he's so different from them, right? He is a nobleman who is also a Christian monk. So he is as, as different as two, three people can be, you know? So uh, on the one hand, they are all teenage boys, but then on the other hand, their backgrounds make them completely different. So all of them change their views through their friendship. So they, I think that when they first went raiding, they thought, uh, okay, so our enemy is this king who wants to make us all Christians, and that is a bad thing. So we are going to to uh, fight some Christians, and well, they they don't really go to kill them because they are monks. But of course, incidents happen. Um, so they they mostly go there to make a point and to and to take the the riches. But of course, things happen. Uh, so, um, but they, but they say, okay, so they are the, the bad people because they are Christians, but of course, no, getting to know Aiden, they realize that, uh, okay, he, he's not so different from us mm -hmm. in, in essential, in essential terms. What happened to the other people at Aiden's monastery? Does he get to meet them again or did they mostly die? <laughs> Um, yeah, that's now he, he gets to meet some of them. Yeah, because he is, uh, there are different ships and they are taken to different locations, but the ones who are taken to the same place, yeah, they, they are with Aiden and they, yeah, um, Aiden gets to, um, to, to be for a while with uh, another monk at the monastery who was also uh, a few years, so he's also young, he's also uh, well, a few years older than I did. And even though they didn't get along in any way, they, they didn't interact much at the monastery, now they are sort of forced to interact because they are the only Englishmen in, in, in that part, so. Yes, we, we will get to see other monks as well. It's not just Aiden. How do they adjust to the lifestyle? Like, do you think Aiden thinks it's the hardest or is it even worse for those people? Um, yeah, that's a really good question. It's, I think that, um, well, this, th this guy that Aiden is with in the beginning, uh, he can understand the language a bit better. So he sort of acts like a mediator between Aiden and, uh, and the Norsemen because he, um, uh, he, he is from a part uh, where um, he, he has to deal with a lot of Danish people. 
uh, because there were a lot of Danes in Northumbria at the time, but I didn't really have to do with him because his family was, uh, wasn't Danish. I mean, he, he was the alderman's son, so pretty much everyone was, uh, was English in, among the people he had to deal with. So they, he knows um, the, the Norse language better. And, but um, I'm not sure who, who accommodates better. Eventually it is Aiden, of course, but um, the thing with Aiden is that he, he eventually is more open-minded, uh, especially when it comes to their religion. Mm -hmm. So I think this is what, what helps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because the others are more, like, they're more focused on Christianity and they still think the others are savages, right? Yes, exactly. Exactly, yes. Yes, so, so, so they have, um, I, they, um, they see them as savages because of their uh, faith. I think they are more superstitious. I think that this is a better way to describe it. The others are more superstitious. So they think that, of course, they, they do all kinds of evil magic. And so you have to guard themselves from them. But at the same time, uh, well, I think Aiden is more arrogant towards them, um, but not out of the same reasons. Mm -hmm. I think it's not such big an issue for him. Mm -hmm. For him, I think it's more like the intellectual thing, right? You know, being yes, able exactly. to read and kind of like Ingvar, because Ingvar also considers himself to be more intellectually developed than a lot of the people around him. And this is why Aiden and Ingvar get along, right? Oh, yes, exactly, exactly, yes. Um, Aiden, uh, Aiden thinks that he is very, uh, well, he, he had too much education to be uh, the slave of illiterate people or, or mostly illiterate people. And uh, yes, it is similar to Ingvar's attitude, and, but, but Ingvar doesn't really think himself too educated because he hasn't received any formal education, but he just thinks that he, is, he has a brilliant mind and he, he thinks he's just so quick thinking compared to other people and everyone is just so slow and dull and <laughs> that, that is Ingvar's problem. But yes, essentially it is the same issue. So they both think themselves intellectually superior to those around them. So this is eventually what brings them together. Like, uh, this is the only person in the town that I can actually talk to. <laughs> As a side note, what did Ingvar think of Eyjolf's um, intelligence? I know he thought he was very smart because that's how he became famous, but does he think he's as intellectual as he is? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, well, yes, I think he is. I mean, it's, it's just a different kind of intelligence. Ingvar, I think, prides himself on his um, philosophical thinking, we can say, but well, it, it's kind of the same with Eolf, right? Because he has that philosophy of love, you know? I mean, uh, but, but it's in a different way because Eolf was smart enough to, to, to put up, uh, uh, to come up with a philosophy that was actually popular and that something that he could sell to people. And this is how he became so popular. So yes, Ingvar does see the merits of that, and he does see Eolf intellectual merits. And um, um, so, yes, he definitely thinks that Eolf is one of those people that he can actually talk to. And he respects him because his, his medical knowledge vastly surpasses Ingvar. So there's finally someone who can tell him things that he doesn't already know, which is a great <laughs> problem for Ingvar. <laughs> Why do you have to tell me that I haven't already heard? Please say something new. You know, <laughs> this is his attitude when he meets someone. And Aiden and Eolf are certainly two people who can tell him a lot of things that he didn't know. Mm -hmm. That's true. Does he think that Aiden is more philosophical, like in general, not just about like having a specific philosophy, like the philosophy of love? Is he more, does he consider him to be more intellectual or less intellectual than Eolf? Uh, yeah, definitely more intellectual, but I'm not sure that Aiden 
uh, is as original in his thinking as Elf is. So maybe this is one way that um, Aydan's ideas are inferior. But it is, of course, unfair to judge it like this because Aydan is 18 and Elf is 24. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's, of course, a great uh, difference in experience. And um, so, so maybe this is why why this difference is. So Aiden has had a lot of theoretical knowledge, which he understands quite well. I mean, he, he was indeed very, very good at, at the learning that he did there and he greatly enjoyed it, but he hasn't really applied all those things, you know. So he, he would make a very good teacher, but at this point he doesn't have Eos originality of ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I mean, even when Aiden is older, I don't think he comes up with anything specifically like original, right? <clears throat> I think his philosophy is more about thinking about things in general and maybe discussing them with someone, but he doesn't really come up with an idea like Eolf does and market it. Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Also because Aiden's kind of uh, intellect is not as pragmatic as Eolf. It, it's, it, it's more on the theoretical side. So, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely Eolf is the one who, who can make a business out of anything. <laughs> like he does with so many things in his life. <laughs> and that's how he's successful. Oh, yeah, exactly. He, he gets to sell so many things that other people didn't really think would be for sale. You know, he can sell anything. <laughs> oh, my God. He's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> he would agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think he's the kind of person, you know, if he and Ingvar were a couple, Eolf would be like, oh, you are the most intelligent man I've ever known, apart from me, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh so this God. is the kind of compliments that Eolf would make. <laughs> what would Ingvar think? Like, does he also think the opposite? Like, you are the most intelligent person, Eolf, except for me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a good question. Um... Yes, I think so, at least until he meets Aiden, yes. But then if, if he were to, to meet them at the, at the same time, uh, yeah, I, I don't really know. I, I can just say that Eolf would be jealous. And Eolf is really not a jealous person, but, but I think Aiden could make him jealous. <laughs> But he knows that Aiden is not homosexual or bisexual. So then he kind of oh, yeah. knows that he doesn't have that oh, yeah. ability to take Ingvar away from him because he's not homosexual or bisexual. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But I'm not sure that is enough. I mean, he knows that it will not happen, but I think he would still be quite jealous that um, Ingvar would like it to happen, you know. <laughs> But after Eolf, you know, um, doesn't end up with Ingvar, no spoilers, but, you know, he doesn't end up with him. I can say that at least, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so after that happens, how does Ingvar see Aiden? I know this is totally off topic. I just realized <laughs> we turned this podcast into Ingvar and Aiden and Eolf <laughs> when we were supposed to be talking about Midsummer. But like, how does he see him? Like, do you think his experiences with Eolf and what happened with Eolf influenced how he sees Aiden? Does he become more closed off and more cynical about relationships or falling in love with some someone? I mean, he was already cynical to begin with, but after Eolf, is he even more cynical? Um, well, I think that he, no, I actually think the opposite. I think he is maybe more, I'm, I'm not sure if he's more open, but he is more conscious that you can have someone and and lose them. So he, he would be more, um, I don't know, careful or protective in that way. So I think that it is a positive thing ultimately for his relationship with Aiden. But at the same time, he doesn't, he is more, uh, skeptical about manifesting uh his feelings you know so yeah i think this is how how it influences his relationship with Aiden. Mm, i see yeah 
<laughs> yeah, I know it, it, it is a bit off topic, but uh, well, Aiden and Ingvar are important people in, in the lives of Helgi and Lars, so it's not all that off topic because they have a lot of interactions with each other. Um, yes, and, and, and interestingly enough, even though, uh, well, Ingvar, Helgi and Lars are the ones who are Norwegian, it is mostly Aiden that bridges their communication because uh, Helgi and Lars have very little to do with Ingvar because Ingvar does not lower himself to their <laughs> level. <laughs> he really doesn't look upon them favorably, right? Like he thinks they're really not intelligent. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he, he thinks that um, they're really simple minded kids. They are nice and they are useful. Uh, at times when they can well, perform the tasks that he gives them. I mean, he, he's rather skeptical about them performing the tasks, but he, 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 he's not a very patient person. So he doesn't really have patience for kids trying to prove themselves. <laughs> he's, he's the kind of guy who thinks, oh, more kids? How many people do I have to train in this? <laughs> but he eventually lets them and just to see how they how they do. And uh, but other than the fact that he finds them useful, I'm not. He really finds them simple minded. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of the time, I didn't finds them. I mean, in the beginning, he definitely finds them simple minded as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then he realizes that there are so many other qualities that someone can have. Mm -hmm. Even if they are not educated, even if they are not intellectuals, there are a lot of things that are extremely important because no matter how much I don't admire Zingvar, there's, well, his relationship with Helgi and Lars is so much nicer and easier and so much more friendly because Ingvar is a very difficult person even with someone like Aiden who whom he actually likes so we can imagine how he is with people he doesn't like so definitely Aiden uh, gets to value um, friendliness more than intellectual mm -hmm. capacities. I think that shows that he has developed a lot as a person and grown to mature more throughout his adventure, if we can call it that, in Scandinavia. Because I think before he had a very closed-minded approach and you know that really led to him becoming very arrogant in a way. Mm, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Uh, well, of course, his arrogance is mostly out of bitterness because he is in a, in a bad place in his life. But yes, he, he, he does manifest himself in that way. And mm -hmm. even with Helgi and Lars, with whom he is a bit unfair. I mean, it's not really unfair, but he doesn't know them. He just knows that mm -hmm. these were among the people who raided mm -hmm. the monastery. So he, he feels entitled to look down upon them mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. That makes but sense. This, yeah, one, once he gets to know them, he changes his opinion on a lot of things. So in, including homosexuality and uh, uneducated people because mm -hmm. he, he really hasn't uh, did, hasn't had to do much with with people who are not nobles so with peasants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he has nothing to do with peasants until that moment. So. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Before he meets anyone, like before he goes to Scandinavia, was Aiden always arrogant for the same reason? Even though he didn't have bitterness, well, not as much bitterness. He still had bitterness about his brother and like, you know, his family situation and everything. But did he feel like he was like smarter than everyone else? And that was why he didn't really have that many friends? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, that, that's a good question. I don't think he's naturally an arrogant person. But I think it comes with bitterness. So at the monastery, because he doesn't, he's not arrogant to begin with. So he doesn't really judge people for not being nobles like he is. But uh, when, when he's met with hostility, because, um, I don't know, people are envious of him, for example, or they, they I don't know, have, have different stupid dissensions, 
either reverse to being arrogant. So I think that this this comes when someone shows him hostility, he he would probably say, oh, of course, because they're they're stupid. They don't they don't have my upbringing, my education. So this is why they have this. They are acting like this towards me. Mm, I see. So I think naturally speaking, it's it's Ingvar who's the most arrogant. Oh yes, definitely, definitely because um, I think it is due to their upbringing because Aiden was raised with a lot of compassion and he doesn't like people who are arrogant like his father. I mean, his father isn't really arrogant, but he's very uh, demanding and I think he, he and uh, not only demanding, but he doesn't, um, he doesn't like Aiden very much and he manifests it. So being insulting other people, he, he really dislikes that because he knows what it's like to, to be insulted by your father. So he doesn't do that. But with Ingvar, he was raised to, to believe that he is so much better than everyone else. But as Ingvar, whereas Aiden is not, quite the opposite. His father tells him that he is no good. <laughs> and his mother tells him to, to always be nice to people and not be like his father. So they had a very different upbringing in this respect. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And Eyalf, like where would he fall in like in the arrogance spectrum? Do you think he is considered arrogant? Um, yeah, <laughs> okay. That's, I think it's more difficult to answer with Eyalf because uh, Eyalf is uh, part of two very different worlds because he used to be very, uh, very poor and uh, uh, an, an orphan, and then he got to be very rich. So he is, um, he definitely believes he is incredibly smart because he, he managed to go all that way, uh, not having a lot of help from the outside. So he, he is a self-made man and he's really proud of himself because of this. And uh, most of the time he doesn't want to admit that he used to be part of that world of the lower classes. So he pretends that he, he is a nobleman and he comes up with that story where he, he is mysterious about his past, but he, he lets on that he is a nobleman, in fact. So he, he runs from his origins. So maybe he would say, maybe we would say that he is arrogant in the fact that he obviously looks down on lower classes if he doesn't if he's ashamed of being part of the lower classes. But it's not that he looks down on other people. He just believes that he is, he is so much better than the, the hand he was dealt with from faith, from, from faith, you know? <laughs> so um, in this sense, I'm not sure that really makes him arrogant. Yeah, he can act like a, div like a diva <laughs> a lot of the times, but I think it's just that. I, I don't think he's very arrogant. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, definitely not in the sense that Ingvar is. Mm -hmm, I see. And Lars and Helgi are not arrogant, I would say. Oh, no, no, not at mm -hmm. all. I think they are the kind of people who think that everyone is really good and that there are only nice people in the world. So I think that they are very naive. Um, maybe the most naive of all my characters. Uh, mm -hmm. we, have, we have this kind of naivety in Hakon as well, but it's a lot more with Helgi and Lars. Mm -hmm. so, I don't yeah. think Hakon thinks that everyone is nice though, right? Yeah, not really. I mean, uh, he thinks that everyone is nice in the beginning, but he is on his guard. Uh, I mean, he, he cannot really be, be tricked by people unless <laughs> by people we mean a very beautiful woman. And even then uh, he, he eventually tries to keep away from shady people. But with Helgi and Lars, I don't think they are ever judgmental about anyone. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, uh, they are definitely the least arrogant and the more naive out of, out of all my characters. I think that is why, you know, they kind of fall for the, yeah, let's attack the Christians. And then they kidnap Aiden and they bring him back and then they want to be friends with him because they just don't see any contradiction in that. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, of course, I didn't think that they must be really stupid to not see anything <laughs> wrong with them. <laughs> or maybe they didn't recognize him. Like they, they just attacked the place and they randomly kidnapped people, but they forgot to look at their faces properly. <laughs> so then when they see Aiden again, they're like, oh, who is this guy? Oh, let's be friends with him. Because <laughs> <laughs> they don't have photography back then. So they forgot because they were under so much stress when, it, when they were doing the raiding. <laughs> Well, yeah, unfortunately, there are so few Englishmen in that part of, the, of Norway that it is impossible to not realize that that is the guy. But uh, on the other hand, that may be very true about Aiden, because he sees so many new faces at, during the raid, and then when, when they go back, so on the voyage back to Norway, but he's not on the same ship with everyone. So, uh, well, when, when he does get to meet everyone, he doesn't uh, really remember, oh, so, so this was the bad guy, or was he the really bad guy, or the guy who was okay, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that may be true for Aiden. <laughs> how, does he, how does he know that Lars and Helgi were the people who kidnapped him? Do they tell him, or does he just assume that they are because they're all part of the same group, or... Like, how does he know? Because there's so many faces. Like, how did he know that it was them? Oh, uh, well, now that they were on the same ship. Oh, so, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't really play a direct part in kidnapping Aiden. They, they were just part of the group. I mean, the, the only one that uh, Aiden really interacts with is Hakon. Mm. Yeah. So Hakon played a bigger role, right? Mm, yeah, exactly. So basically, he was the one who kidnapped Aiden. Mm -hmm. So does Aiden dislike him the most? Um, yes, I think he does dislike him the most. But at the same time, he is the most afraid of Ingvar because Hakon talks to him and all that. But Ingvar is the, is the one who is, well, very strange looking and doesn't even look at him and so, <laughs> and so i don't think that oh okay, that that that's the real bad guy <laughs> wait till i get to know him the final boss <laughs> yeah exactly an evil mastermind <laughs> well he is a mastermind though that's how yeah i think so. <laughs> but i don't know about evil <laughs> Yeah, yeah, definitely for I from Aiden's point of view at that moment, he's definitely evil. I mean, not only does he raid the monastery, but he wants to stop the conversion of Norway to Christianity. So he's like the epitome of evil mastermind. <laughs> Satan himself. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and he finds out that Ingvar himself is gay too. Oh yeah, yeah. But that's but much that later on, right? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure I didn't ever. Oh, he ever never remember. finds out? Yeah, I mean, he doesn't. Yeah, I, I'm not sure he ever <laughs> finds out. <laughs> or at least I haven't got to that point in the story, and I'm not sure I will. Because I know that they become good friends. So does he ever talk to him about his past, like, you know, with Eyolf and stuff? I guess if he oh, told no. him, no, right? No, 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 never. I, Ingvar never goes there. I think he never talks about Eyolf in his <laughs> what? life. What? <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, he talks about Eyolf, but not about the part, I mean, not about the nature of their relationship and his feelings for Eyolf. He never goes there with with anyone. I mean, not even Hakon, who was literally there during the whole thing. Eolf is just this taboo subject. So, so when someone mentions Eolf, Ingvar is like, oh, not again. <laughs> Why are you saying that name? <laughs> well, he's rather like, no one is allowed to say his name but me. <laughs> so I think this is the attitude, you know. I mean, Hakon, yeah, it's okay. Hakon was there, so he can say his name. But with other people, he he really dislikes that. It's it's mm, one of the things that I see. <laughs> Wait, does Reinveig know about Eolf? I don't even know if I asked that before. I think I think she is the one actually that he, that does, and I think that Aiden um uh, finds it out from her. I mean, she doesn't have 100% proof because she wasn't there and she never met Eolf in person. But 
she's the one who figures out that there was something more between them. And so she asks different people. She asks Hawthorne and other people. And, and the more she, she finds out about Eolf uh, and compares it to what she has find out about Ingvar once they have a closer relationship, the more convinced she is that Ingvar was in fact gay and there was something between them. Does that make her not like him as much? Because she always had a crush on him, right? <laughs> um, yeah, n- I'm not, no, I don't think so. I think the opposite. Because she can finally explain why he didn't love her back, oh. which makes it so much better than the fact that, well, she, she assumes that she is not good enough for him, you know? But once she realizes that, she is suddenly okay with everything. She's like, okay, that explains it. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. Do hell hell does Largi and Hell sorry, Lars and Helgi. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh, I mixed up the syllables. <laughs> oh yeah, that's fine. Helgi and Lars know about Aolf? No, right? I don't oh, know. Oh <laughs> yeah, I think well they know stories about him because everyone knows stories about him. And I think that Helgi and Lars find those stories all the more interesting. I mean, they would so much like to be there at his parties. They they would be so happy. I think that they actually talk about it (laughs) because they are all about wild parties, or at least they say they are. I'm not really sure how wild they actually are, but they like to be seen as really wild (laughs) party animals, you know? (laughs) Kind of like Sam. He says he's really wild, but probably not. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yes. Yes. And so I think that even with Aiden, they would go on and on. I mean, if if Aiden asks, okay, uh, guys, I heard this name, Eolf Solrav, and who was this guy? I think that they would just start raving about, oh, he was so cool. He was throwing these wild parties, you know. And, oh, if I was at his party, I would do this and this, you know. So I think they find him really awesome like a a role model you know but they also find Ingvar a role model but they they are also a bit afraid of Ingvar but they all it would I mean they're I think they're really scared of Ingvar even when or especially when they work for him because uh they are always afraid that they are not good enough or that they will make a mistake and Ingvar would say take these oaths away from my face you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because he has this kind of attitude with people and Helgi and Lars uh, no matter how they front as confident guys uh, yeah they're actually quite shy I think and uh, they often have the have this worry that they are not good enough compared to certain people like Ingvar and even Aiden but Eolf is much easier to get along with so mm-hmm. they would like Eolf so much more. <laughs> do, do you think they know that, like, have they heard the rumors that Eolf was in a relationship with Ingvar? Um, uh, well, I'm not sure. You know that I wrote a short story that was sort of about this, about a relation, I'm mean, not really a relationship, but, but an interaction between Lars, in particular, and Ingvar, where they know, well, I, I don't think that happens in canon. I mean, that definitely doesn't happen in canon in that way, but I'm not sure how much they will know about it. But what I can be sure is that if they do hear rumors about Ingvar, they will certainly not believe them because Ingvar is so manly, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> not even they would believe that Ingvar is gay you know i mean they should know better but he is still so manly <laughs> but aolf like do, do they do they know that aolf might be because he was more feminine oh yeah definitely but then yeah everybody knows that aolf is oh right so, yeah that's true so, yeah so yeah that, that would uh i mean they would admire ale for completely different reasons than they admire ingvar of course because ingvar is there role model and uh, being a warrior I mean and but Eolf he's the role model as a master of parties (laughs) Uh, yeah 
how do you think Helgi and Lars would get along with Sam? I think they would get along pretty well. <laughs> they would go on and on about how much of a party animal they are, right? But in reality, <laughs> none of them are really that intense. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, I think that they would not throw parties, but they would always talk about, oh, guys, we should have a party and do this and this. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that is so awesome. But then they never do it, you know? <laughs> or they do it, but then, like, they just leave after one hour because they're so tired or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, they, they, they are really excited for 30 minutes and then afterwards one of them is like, I'm really tired, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, I think this is what they would do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they just like to boast about it, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think I think that this is one of the main things with Helgi and Lars because they do that with so many things and they also have this in common with Sam. They They have an image right of, of themselves which kind of involves these kind of things which shows that they do find that really awesome but at the same time it's not really them right no so i think i think it's mostly because of lars right because he's more introverted so does that influence how helgi doesn't hold as many parties as he says he would oh yeah that's a good point yeah i think it is because if we think about Midsummer and the party that happens with Helgi and Lars, uh, well, Lars is the one who actually leaves exactly when things were getting interesting, right? Because they, they both find, find themselves some girls to hang out with. And just when this happens, Lars suddenly leaves. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, I think, I think that would happen, yes. That makes sense. Random question. I know this is so off topic, but how would Ingvar see Sam? Would he see him as another dumb person, just like Lars and Helgi? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. Uh, if I mean, yes, it's not really about this, but uh, yeah, I think in the beginning, yes, definitely. But then Ingvar is the opposite of Helgi, Lars, and Hakon, right? So he, he begins by assuming that everyone is really stupid. And, <laughs> and then they're, they're all just clowns. So, so definitely, uh, I mean, people usually are either really stupid, really mean, or just clowns, you know? <laughs> and so it's, it's one of these three options within water. So definitely he would place Sam in one of these categories, in, in the clown category, <laughs> definitely. But once he got to know him, yeah, that, that would be a different thing. But I'm, it, it depends on how they get to know each other because he, Ingvar tries so hard to, to keep away from people that he actually manages to keep away from a lot of people <laughs> because even Helgi and Lars, if, if he got to know them better, he would realize that they are, they're kind of cute, <laughs> I think. <laughs> I mean, they're really not bad people, but he doesn't uh, put the effort. So with Sam, um, it depends on the context and how they met. But if he were to know Sam better, no, I actually think that he would he would like him in 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 the kind of way in which he likes Aiden. But I mean, not okay, not bad. But <laughs> yeah, the, the other things. So um, yeah, so provided that he got to know him and to see that he is not a shallow person who just puts up a front, then yes, I, I think I think he would like him. Does he would he think he's intellectual or does he think he's more like an A golf kind of smart? Um well well if if we take Sam as being a lawyer and an actor, I think that those are actually certain things that would uh, would fit in our society really well. Because in our society, uh, well, being a lawyer was actually a, a profession and a very re respected one at that. And also, if we think about being an actor, uh, like being a, a scald, then maybe, then, then definitely it is a respected profession. So if it is someone who, who has a great memory and someone who performs and recites 
things, that's also very much respected. It is, it means wisdom. I mean, both being a lawyer and being an performer like in that sense means wisdom which is uh, perhaps the most important thing in our society next to being a, <laughs> a manly warrior you know <laughs> so uh, so yes i he would find sam a respectable person once he gets uh, over the over some of sam's mannerisms if we can say that <laughs> yeah which are kind of similar to I guess Helgi's, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he would be a combination between Helgi and Eil. So, <laughs> yeah, so, so he's someone who, uh, who acts in a ridiculous way, but underneath it all, he, he's the smart guy. You know? <laughs> yeah. This is how Ingvar would see him. <laughs> Does he kind of wish that someone like him would not put up such a ridiculous front? Yeah, definitely. He would be like, why are you doing that? Why would you like people to think that you're a clown? I, I really don't understand that. <laughs> it's so people won't think he's arrogant because I think he can be a little bit arrogant. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, in, in in the sense of uh, uh, Ingvar or Aiden, how do you say how, how do you say he's arrogant? Uh, what do you mean, like Sam? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I would say that he's a little bit arrogant because I think he thinks that he's smarter than like not like book smart, but like he he doesn't like to follow conventions, right? That's when I guess that could be seen as arrogant because why do you think you're better than everyone else who chooses to follow convention? Oh, yeah, definitely. So in, in the sense in which Eolf is arrogant, right? Because he thinks, I'm so original. I have the guts and the, mm -hmm. the, the creativity to just go out of the box. Exactly. So, yeah. Because yeah. Sam wants to go out of the box. He doesn't want to be, you know, the typical middle class lawyer professional, right? He wants to do what he wants, not what society or parents say is best for him. Yeah, exactly. And, and he takes great pride in being able to detach himself from that from, from the mentalities of uh of his time right so yeah i think he has a lot in common with Eilf in this respect mm -hmm, More definitely than respect. so also the the performative aspect and this kind of pragmatic originality mm -hmm. i think both of them are very creative and they're proud to be different from everyone else Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. a, a lot more so than I did. So Sam is a lot more like Ale in this respect. And he knows how to sell himself. Exactly, exactly. So I actually think that Ingvar would see him as a combination between uh, Ale and Aiden at best and someone who, <laughs> who, who, who seems something like Helgi. And when he's first <laughs> here, <laughs> that's so a weird works. combination <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, that makes sense so what in what way do you think sam is the most like Aiden? um uh, well in the fact that they are both uh sheltered and sort of i mean on the intellectual side so well i mean I know that Sam is not really studious, but uh, this is how he is perceived in his time. But of course, compared to most people in medieval Scandinavia, he would be really intellectual. So, <laughs> I mean, he goes to university, right? He, so he, yes, if, if, if we keep the proportions, then he would be quite intellectual and and sheltered and raised in you know in a way in which he believes that uh having an intellectual profession is important so That's like, true mm -hmm. like Aiden mm -hmm. not like Eolf who doesn't I mean he's, he's he's very far from being intellectual I mean he's he's the smart person who is not intellectual if, if we can say that that makes sense, yeah. So for Eilf, it is mostly important to, to make money and fame, but not beyond that, you know? Well, Sam loves fame, too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think it's because he thinks fame is a way out of this kind of conventional lifestyle. Because if you're not famous, how else can you not be conventional? 
Yeah, that's right. And, and it makes you, it gives you the opportunity to go uh, to do all sorts of out of the ordinary things. And people would just say, oh, he's an actor. That, so that makes it okay. Actors are eccentric. Everybody knows that. And actors are, well, they can be wild and depraved. And that's okay because they are actors, right? So this is this is the, the way in which Elf is seen as well. I mean, certain things which would be uh, outrageous or ostracized even with other people because it's someone like Elf that does them, that makes it okay. So that's sort of the same thing with Aiden and uh, the actor profession, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's really interesting to think about. <laughs> <laughs> to compare all these characters. Yeah, I think we should have a future episode where we do more comparisons. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was thinking of one where we can talk about Aiden versus Sam as protagonists. Oh yeah, that's a good idea. That's yeah. a good idea because I think I, I only talked about Aiden uh, a couple of times. So th there is so much more to say about him. So he yeah, we, we should talk more about him, especially since, you know, people on tap just haven't had the chance to read more about him. Exactly, exactly. Well, I probably will have some short story with him. So uh, yeah, that would also be a good opportunity to, to discuss Aiden more. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank you. This was really fun indeed. <laughs> Yeah, see you. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye.